I used to use uh, Logic Pro for about a decade, but I've recently switched to Digital Performer 9. The reason for that switch, by the way, um, is because in Digital Performer, you can do something where you can set up these V racks and have your sounds available to every cue that you write for a particular movie. In Logic, you had to close and then reopen another cue. Sometimes that would uh, reinitiate loading sounds. It would, it would just take like seven to ten minutes to switch cues. And uh, but this way, with uh, V racks, you can use chunks, which are like sequences. It's just another word for sequences, uh, which is just another word for cues in film music. To to have all your your chunks, every chunk, every cue available on tap for the entire project for the next 30 days of you working on the project and you have a V-Rack that's just live with all of your sounds it's a virtual rack of equipment um, that all of those tap into and uh, you can switch between all of them copy paste bars you know this kind of thing very quickly without opening and closing files it's all up at one time but that was my main reason for switching from the logic to um, Digital Performer. But at this point, you know, you use something called VE Pro, the Vienna Ensemble Pro, which even takes the uh, the rack outside of Digital Performer and puts it on across as many computers as you need. Um, you get uh, a license for up to three, so that way you can host all of your samples and your uh, effects and everything uh, on other computers. And um, then switching sequences is done you know in MIDI because you're a digital performer or your logic or whatever your DAW is if you're on PC um, you just use it as a MIDI device but you have all the audio coming back in and out of it as well that's VE Pro 5 by the way is the name of that VE Pro 5 do I use different channels for different articulations or key switching Logic Pro X okay yeah great um, both, really. Um, you know, I, I'll have, uh, I like to, to set it up so that, you know, if I'm on an instrument, as much of the articulations as possible, I can get right there. Uh, whether it's with key switching or switching through faders, or fade, cross fading to different uh, articulations or dynamic layers or whatnot. Try to get it all as much as possible on all the controllers and everything right in front of me and for that one particular uh, instrument okay but then you know uh, sometimes you you do need to switch over to another another track in order to get some other articulation mostly that's because you needed to come from a different library and you couldn't quite program it you know it's, it's, it, it would it's very difficult to program different libraries together into a key switching system um, it's just much easier just to like add another track and then you have another channel basically for that other articulation or articulation set as a beginner wanting to get into movie soundtrack composition what do you suggest I start with? Absolutely Digital Performer. It's the most logical of the DAWs on both PC and Mac. It's ironic that Logic is probably the most illogical of them all. It's, it's a pretty obtuse piece of software, but it's very powerful. It's you know programmed for you know computer language, and uh, because of that, it's very efficient. But it's also not quite visual and logical as you would expect to be. And logic is definitely something it's not. Totally go with Digital Performer because, you know, you can just make songs with it. it, it it's, it's fully expendable. You can do like Pro Tools level audio editing with it. Um, and then you can do uh, MIDI sequencing and you can mix them all together, you know. And you have, you have incredible capabilities with that Digital Performer. 9 is the latest version. I recommend that. Um, it's only a couple hundred bucks, and I think there are some student discounts, too. Absolutely. I mean, you have to remember, you have to realize that, for instance, let's talk about, like, James Horner. He did Titanic. The question was, what do you think about doing movies for free just to get credits or whatever? Okay, James Horner only got, I think they had uh, $600,000 for him on 
on Titanic, which is not a lot of money for Titanic, okay? So um, my point is, though, that with that $600,000, James Horner, uh, for, as far as I know, he took three hundred or 400000 and he put that into the budget for hiring Celine Dion and making that song. So basically, all he left himself with was like $150,000 to score Titanic, and then the rest of the budget went to making the song. So the point I'm getting is he... he, he he didn't really make money. It wasn't like a big deal for him, the money, the money, for doing Titanic. Well, you know, he did it basically for it to boost his career. And, uh, you know, if James Horner can do it at the level of Titanic, then you can do a movie for free just to get a credit on IMDb. So, yeah, I definitely think, you know, you just got to work. You know, if you're going to be doing, if you're the choice is should you do something for free or not, and you're just starting out, uh, you should just never refuse the opportunity to do something to give yourself experience and wisdom uh, in this craft, you know. So you should definitely uh, do free work. There's instances where the composer has paid to work on a film and it might have been in exchange for more gross points, for instance, because they believe in it and if it does go big, uh, they can make a lot more money by working on the film than by not working on the film. So they can get those gross points. If you got like two or three gross points on a film, that's 3%, you understand, of all the money that the movie makes. So if it makes, you know, like for instance, let's talk about like Blair Witch Project. You know, I think it made beyond $50 million. If you had three gross points in that, what is that? 1.5 million? Man, I'd pay $250,000 to work on that movie. <laughs> gross point, okay, so uh, the gross and net. Um, gross would be uh, a percentage uh, that you get out of the gross income that comes in, revenue. Net points would be uh, after there's pr some margin for profit so after they've paid uh, back anything they owe other people, um, advertising costs, all that kind of stuff, then whatever's left, you'll get three. If you get net points, you get 3% of that. So you, know, you never want to negotiate for net points. You're never going to see money if you negotiate for net points. You want gross points. And <laughs> I think there's a movie, I think it's um, Grand Canyon, and Steve Martin plays a... Uh, a movie producer in that, and uh, his license plate is Gross Points. You know, you definitely want to try to get Gross Points, but you know, composers don't really get Gross Points. This is something that you know y you might get if you're making a lot of sacrifices, and they really want you because you're providing them with exactly what they need, and uh, you can kind of say, hey, you know, what about give me a Gross Point? I'll take you know a, a pay cut. Or a gross point. That's if you believe in the project. If you don't believe in the project, you know, get your money and run. <laughs> Do your job and run. Uh, the John Williams Star Wars relationship, as far as oh, gross points. Yeah, he probably does have that. Yeah, he probably has that leverage. Although it depends on what the original contract was back in the seventies. You know, so they might. You know, he might not have had the foresight then to know that he would have so much leverage. Um, as the composer for that project later. But if he had a good agent, uh, then hopefully they wrote that in. And now he's, you know, uh, got that as leverage. And if they need it, you see, they can buy that from you. So let's say you have it in your contract that all future Star Wars films, if you're going to score them, you get, say, two gross points or two and a half gross points or whatever. Then, uh, but... You know, they want to hire Tom Cruise to star in that movie, and he demands points, but, you know, you only have 100% of gross available. So if you've already given away 70%, you know, 20% to the producer, 10% to this guy, 5 to, you know, it's all divvied up, and there's really nothing left, they may want to buy your points back from you to give to Tom Cruise. And uh, so that's leverage, you know, and you could, in that case, you know, it was probably worth, if, if somebody was going to buy that from John Williams, God, it would probably be worth, I don't know. 40 million.
what do I think about plagiarism? Do I ever go down that path when time is a factor? Okay, now the, the plagiarism thing. Um, you build your craft up based on tools that are paradigms. So when there's a moment where you're not quite getting the inspiration or something, but you know exactly what mood needs to be created, um, you might wind up uh, doing something from just your craft. And you should work on building that up with techniques that... Uh, that seem to work, you know, movie to movie to movie to movie, and often that's going to be composer to composer to composer. Now, copying someone exactly, some one guy, and just like, you know, obsessively uh, plagiarizing somebody, that's different. But if you can build your foundation from what seems to be the paradigms for creating, you know, whatever action sequence music it is, or horror sequence music it is, you know, if you can see what the general gist is across all... Uh, composers in in those genres and use that as your foundation uh, then uh, when you need to you can just sort of like plaster that generic wallpaper whenever needed and then um, you know part of your craft ought to be to also tweak that a little bit massage it so that it, it starts to have some of the originality of the full score and perhaps you can layer on some themes and uh, orchestrate that together and weave it together so that it actually sounds integrated. And basically, that's what <laughs> that's what we're doing when we're really working fast, you know. And uh, you can end up also building your foundation on your own ideas of how you think those things should be expressed. That's very cool, you know. Somebody like Jerry Goldsmith, Bernard Herrmann, uh, these guys developed kind of their own language for communicating the dramatic needs of the film with music in the ways that they invented for themselves. And you can do that for yourself, especially if you're just starting out, instead of learning what everybody else is doing and copying and making that your foundation, you can just work hard on creating something and uh, in, in that communicates a particular emotion and drama and style, and then pass that to you know a dozen of your friends and ask them, what does this music convey to you? And see what they say back. And uh, if it's not what you intended, then you missed and you need to try again, you know. Um, but if it is, then there you go. You've got your own way of communicating that particular uh, drama. You ask them, what do you picture when you're listening to this, you know? And they tell you, oh man, I, you know hot air balloons being burnt to the ground. <laughs> and you're like, exactly. As far as PRO, uh, Performance Rights Organization for the rest of you, um, that depends on what country you're in. Uh, if you're in the United States... Um, First of all, when you register for a PR uh, for a PRO, okay, for the United States, I mean, I recommend BMI over ASCAP for for film composing. Um, uh, there's not enough time, I think, on my battery on the phone right now to really get into the depth on that. But one thing you should realize is that you can register with any PRO in the world from wherever you are, okay, and they will be your PRO in representation for whatever territories that you don't carve out. So probably the best in the world is PRS in uh, England, in the United Kingdom. Um, that's because they also uh, collect for your mechanical rights, which is something that in the United States uh, they don't collect for. Um, because in the United States we don't really have mechanical uh, revenue from film th showings um, because of the, just our Constitution uh, for, forbade, um, they don't consider that a... Uh, public performance. So when you buy a ticket, you go to a theater that's a private performance, so you don't get paid for private performances, you get paid for public performances. That's what you know, PROs are for. But um, anyway, PRS in England uh, will give you mechanical uh, your mechanical residuals uh, for all the territories that do collect that and have the rights to collect that at those different countries. Um, and you can do something like you can be in the USA with BMI, only, and then PRS for the rest of the world, and different things like that. You just have to spell it out with the PRO before you're while you're registering with them. 
that you want to carve out some territories. All right, and the other question somebody had was something about beginning. I talked about earlier about, you know, get the, if you're going to get started, use Digital Performer as your platform. Uh, maybe that person uh, wasn't here during that time when I mentioned that, but I recommend, yeah, Digital Performer of all the DAWs because it's cross-platform. It's PC and it's Mac, and uh, it goes from songwriting to Pro Tools like audio editing to full bore MIDI sequencing on a movie with multiple cues all at the same time. You know, and you can, it's really one of the best. I recommend that one. You can get into other ones and you can be all fruity loopy or whatever <laughs> crazy thing you're going to do, but uh, Digital Performer really is probably the best way if you're starting out to, you know, you're never going to be incapable of anything if you're on Digital Performer. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, it's got a big ass manual, but I mean, you know, when you're a beginner, you you should be in that learning uh, phase, you know, and you want to digest. And you know, if you can master a performer as a beginner, I mean, you can conquer anything that you that comes your way. Is it true most composers use Cubase? Not really. Um, Cubase is probably the number three. Uh, most popular uh, sequencer for film scoring. Are you what? Which kind of uh, music are you asking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's number three. Number one probably is Logic. It depends. They shift back and forth. Um, number two is probably Digital Performer. I think because the computers got more powerful, it's better to be on Digital Performer now. Because Logic is clunkier, a little bit strange, but it was more powerful. But now since computers are more powerful, it's better to use Performer, which is way more easier to use and uh, more fun to use. Um, I mean, you, you've, you can even like create your favorite theme for like how you want your knobs and faders and everything. You can like pick themes and skins basically for the app. So it's it's a lot of fun to use. It's very friendly. It's got a great user interface. It's extremely visual, and and logic isn't that way. And things don't work logically, so you can't quite figure them out. You sort of have to like go okay to do that. I need to go into a user group and ask somebody how the hell do you do this. Um, and then they tell you, okay, well, you got to go over to this other window, which you didn't even know existed, and set up this other thing, which, you know, wasn't even in existence, so you have to add that and make that and cable them together, and it's just ridiculous, man, you know. Logic is very powerful, but um, it's not logical, and it's not fun to use. It really isn't. And Digital Performer is so much fun to use. Do you mix and master your cues, or do you have a mix and master guy? I do all my mixing and my mastering myself because I was a mastering engineer for almost a decade, and um, I used to do mixing as well. And so I have that experience. I have the ears. Um, it's a big task if you don't. So you could probably uh, hire that out if you need to. Um, you know, and uh, by hiring that out, that could mean you invite somebody into your studio to spend some time while you're taking your nap to mix down those cues and master them. Uh, master them, you know, for the movie. Uh, mastering for a CD is a little bit different um, and can come later, you know, or can be done in a separate department, really. Um, the other question was uh, the best brass and string libraries. Um, now you're getting into areas of what we kind of call the secret sauce, you know. Uh, you're asking the chef for the recipes, you know. But um, I'm going to say some general things that are at the top. But uh, if, if any of you want to uh, really uh, friend me, like on Facebook or something, and get some more direct answers, uh, I do run a group over there called um, Film Scoring Mentorship. Look it, look it up and uh, ask to be a member. Inside of there, I might feel more comfortable exposing some of the really secret goodies. If you know, for woodwinds, you've got to have the VSL, uh, the Vienna Symphonic Library, uh, because it covers the, the woodwinds perfectly. Um, although uh, 
v- VSL doesn't really cover the extreme instruments like uh, contra bass, bass clarinet, which is you know extremely low, and th- a lot of the extreme instruments VSL doesn't have, so you have to go over to some other libraries for that. Um, and then for strings, uh, I mix it. I, I use both a VSL for strings and, but mostly primarily, LAS. That's the LA uh, scoring strings, LAS. Um, they're really great, but you know, they do require you to work a little extra hard because you have to, um, in order for it to sound best, uh, record each pass of every two musicians. It's, it's per stand, and it's a stand is a stand, and then you have a musician on each side, and they're reading the same part. Um, and you want to play those in, you know, hopefully not quantize them, so that when you layer everything, it actually sound, it actually kind of like works together in a sort of like fuzzy way. It creates like this larger globular mass of exactly what you were trying to perform, but it doesn't sound like MIDI. It sounds fantastic. And, um, yeah, last is the best for that. Oh, it says 0%. And if we get shut off, then that'll be it for the broadcast. Oh.